Here to introduce the presenter uh, is Greg Knopf, uh, Assistant Dean of the School of Arts, Education, and Humanities. Thanks, Mike. And tonight, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome my colleague, Joe Derry, who's Associate Professor of Film here in the Film Department at the State. Professor Derry specializes in film, video, and animation. And she teaches a, a large number of courses at Queen State, as many of the probably film majors who are here know, in video production, sound, capstones, career development in film and media and animation. And she's worked intensively with students with lots of individualized independent study courses in film. Uh, she holds an MFA from Interdisciplinary Arts from Goddard College. And she completed her BFA in film, animation, and video in the School of Design, or RISD, as popularly known. And she yeah, screened her films uh, okay. regionally, nationally, and internationally, including at the Ann Arbor Film Festival and the International okay. Film Festival in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. She is the winner of numerous awards and grants, including the Helen Hill Award, which supports innovative independent filmmakers, and grants from the LES yes. Foundation, the yes. Free History yes. Project, the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, and the Vermont Arts Council. And we're very much looking forward to tonight's, tonight's presentation and screening, as you can see, of filmmaking practicals, building skills, and community on set. Please join me in offering a warm welcome to Professor Joe Dare. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. You can all hear me okay if I use my teacher voice. Um, so uh, tonight's talk is about a project that I started in the winter of 2019. Um, and it went on for a few years. And there was a break in there at some point, and I'll sort of explain uh, what happened. But um, the practicum project uh, that I designed, I wanted to start with just what is a practicum? Um, a practicum is a project designed to give students practical experience. So we're just going to start with that basic understanding. Um, and then a little bit about my background, which Greg just mentioned, but I went to art school. Um, and when I was there, I studied film animation and video. And uh, sorry, can I? That's me. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's all done. Um, and so when I was in art school, my teachers didn't really know what to do with me. I was studying live action filmmaking, but then I would go take an animation class and I would say, what would happen if I combine these together? Um, and they, they didn't really know where to put me. Um, I was a little all over the place and experimenting. Um, my films at the time, uh, you know, combined, like I said, live action and animation. Um, and after I went to art school, I sort of went even further into exploring other mediums. And I worked in printmaking, I did a lot of cartooning and drawing comics, um, book arts, and I continued to make films. So by the time I went to graduate school uh, at Goddard College, um, I kind of was uh, looking for ways to kind of bring all of these distant different disciplines together. And I started making more multimedia projects. Um, and one of the things I had to do when I was in graduate school was a practicum project. And the way that my graduate school sort of proposed this to us um, was to sort of take your art practice uh, into the community or take it into a community that's not your own, or you know, just find a way to take your practice which might be contained to just you and your studio into some new arena and give it this other kind of practical application. Um, and so at the time I lived in Rhode Island, um, which is home to the Narragansett tribe. And uh, I reached out to, this was only one of three uh, schools for indigenous children on the East Coast called the Nuituan School. Um, and it was for Narragansett children. It was a one room schoolhouse uh, and uh, kids were kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, and I just said, you know, I'm an, a local artist and I wonder if there's a way we could collaborate. I have these, this background and skills and animation and I'm really interested in oral storytelling traditions. And 
of one idea, you know, I was open to how we collaborated, but I said one idea I had was to sort of take a traditional Narragansett story and adapt it with the kids to turn it into an animated film. And so that's what we did. Um, and we made a film called How Birds Got Their Song. And the children did all the artwork and animation. They also did uh, all the music. They played drums and rattles. And we ended up showing this film around a little bit. And uh, a few of the screenings were at the Providence Children's Film Festival. Um, and it actually also showed at the National Museum of the American Indian. And I still sometimes get emails to share this film because um, it's, it's a pretty wonderful little story. Um, so uh, after graduate school, uh, around 2011, I started uh, as a professor of animation at DePaul University in Chicago. And when I was there, uh, they had a program called the Blue Light Program. And what this did was it allowed faculty to sort of create their films with a budget provided by the school, and then students would work on those films. And I, I hear you, I can hear you like, really? That sounds way too good to be true. And it is, uh, and, but it's a huge university in Chicago, thousands and thousands of students. Um, so they had the funding to do this. And um, I proposed, uh, an animation project. And mine was a little bit atypical in that I actually collaborated with my students. Um, they gave a lot of input into the storytelling. And uh, what we came up with, or the, the sort of form that this took was actually a website. And so uh, if you wanna, you can, you know, write that address down if you want, you can look it up later. But we made 10 short animated films and so this is the homepage of the site. And if any, these characters kind of like walk back and forth in their apartments. Um, and the, the story sort of context for, for the stories that are collected here um, is that it's, a, it's folks in Chicago and it's a heat wave. And so every story is sort of like a person experiencing this heat wave in a different way. And so you click on a character and then you see a short little one minute film. And you click on a different one and you see a different story. Um, and that was a wonderful experience for me. And I think of this as a practicum. I, I think the students got a lot of great experience in terms of, um, you know, at a certain point, we were bringing in uh, SAG actors to do voiceover work so they could work with professional voice actors. Um, so I think it was a big success. Uh, and I got a budget to you know, pay some actors and the web designer and somebody to do some sound editing. So I arrive at Keene State in 2014. And as you can see, I'm sort of really committed at this point to trying to bring my own creative research into the classroom. Um, so I'm trying not to like draw this hard boundary of like my work is over here and my students are over here. And then, there are a few realizations I have once I get here and I join the faculty and I get to know the curriculum. And the first thing I realize is I need to be a generalist. So I'm coming from an animation program, but I actually need to be a jack of all trades to, to really help my students. Um, and the other thing I realize is 90% of my students are really interested in narrative filmmaking um, with people, not cartoons. So not little paper birds. They want to use actors and yeah, so um, so I just wanted to run through like, what does it mean to be a generalist? And my colleague Lance is here, which is so amazing because he has to do the same thing as me, um, which is know lots of different approaches to filmmaking, including narrative, documentary, animation, experimental, and to know lots of production tools and formats and all of their relevant workflows. Um, so by workflow, I mean, if I shoot digital video, it's a certain kind of process. If I shoot 16 millimeter, it's a certain kind of process. So I tried to just really quickly do like a mental cataloging of all the different things that we as faculty have to know and be able to instruct. Um, so lots of different types of cameras, 
lots of different kinds of lights, uh, different kinds of sound recorders and microphones, and a whole lot of software. Um, and the great thing about this, as um, Lance can tell you, is it's changing all the time, changes every year. So it's a lot to keep up with. Um, and then in my personal creative practice, there are these tensions that have kind of always been there, um, which is that I draw and I also write. I enjoy doing both. And at times my art practice is very solitary. And at times my art practice is very collaborative. Um, so these are some of the things just to set the stage of like how I got the idea to do this project. So like I said, I'm in film studies. And just so you uh, have a background about the major, uh, we offer tracks in both critical studies and production. We've got about 140 majors right now. So um, in critical studies, students are learning film history and film theory and film analysis, and they're going deeper into like genre or films of a certain region um, or movement. And then in production, they're learning the making. And so what we hope is that students are able to connect those two and have them inform one another. And so for seven years, I have taught the, the senior class uh, called the capstone, um, used to be called P3, P4. And um, for a while, um, you know, it was me just really getting my bearings with this class. Um, but now that I've done it for seven years, I feel like I'm pretty, pretty comfortable with it. Um, and these are some of the things that I found in Capstone. Um, there's some really common issues that I see every year with students, right? So sometimes you have a group of five to six people, and it's really hard for them to meet weekly. It's hard to find some time for everybody to set aside. Personal time management, managing stress. That's a big one. All of you film majors that came in are probably feeling what it's like to manage stress. Um, sharing creative control is big when you collaborate. Practicing direct communication, delegating tasks, follow through. So if you've got a group and you tell one person to go off and take care of something, they have to follow through on that. Um, running out of money, for the project, I've seen that happen. And of course, equipment breaking, which can happen. And these are some common student film pitfalls that I've also seen in like a decade of teaching. Um, child actors, can anyone guess why it's difficult to work with child actors? Yeah. Because they're children, but what, what comes along with children? Parents. Parents. Yeah, so you're not really just working with children, you're also working with parents. Um, crowd scenes can be notoriously difficult because sometimes students think they can post on Facebook like, everybody come you know, to the student center, I've got pizza. And then they kind of think like, hey, I did it. It's gonna be awesome. And then nobody comes, but you, you need like real confirmation when you do a crowd scene. Um, wind is very difficult for sound recording. Noisy locations, so shooting a scene near a river is it will will it's not great for your sound recording. Um, any kind of location that mixes daylight and tungsten light, and any kind of thing that can make uh, continuity editing tricky, like fire or snow. Um, so, for example, if you start to shoot a scene and there's a fireplace and there's a big roaring fire, and it takes you an hour to shoot that scene, at the beginning the fire is this big, and at the end of the seeing, you know, the fires this big and you have to cut all your different camera angles and shot types together. And so that fire has to stay consistent. Um, but by far, uh, the source of a lot of problems in this class that I see is being rushed. So at this time, I also I've noticed some really consistent needs over the past eight years of working with my production students things that they really need, hands-on practice with the equipment. They want, they want and need real world experience on a set. They really need internships and networking opportunities. So these are all things that being in rural New Hampshire can be kind of difficult. It's hard for us to provide that to students because we are not an industry hub um, and Boston is about two hours away. So it's difficult. 
Um, the other thing that I thought a lot about was this camera that we purchased in 2016. And I think we got three of them. Um, and this is a wonderful tool. And when we had this camera, um, we hadn't really used it to its full capacity. So one thing that this camera can do is, is shoot a format called 4K RAW, which is lots and lots of pixels. Um, and the RAW format means that it's like just data. It's not even an image. And you need computer software on the other side of it to process that data into an image. But because of the fact that it's data, you have a lot of control over what the image looks like. So we hadn't maxed this out. So it was kind of like we had a Lamborghini, but we hadn't really like had any fun with it. So I was determined to have fun with this, with this camera. Um, and after having taught this class for so many years and having a background in animation, I really started to feel kind of an imposter syndrome. And I started to, I, I had this constant question of just like how, will I know how to make a narrative short film unless I make one, right? I've made animation, um, I wanna do this other thing. So I started to think, you know, what if I made a capstone was sort of my question that I posed for myself. Um, and so if you're curious if there's a precedent for stuff like this, uh, there certainly is. So this is a scene from A Woman Under the Influence. Do you guys, anybody know this film? It's John Cassavetes from 1974 um, and he made this film. He couldn't get funding for it uh, and actually mortgaged his house. And at the time he was like a filmmaker in residence at the American Film Institute. And so his crew was students and that's how he made the film and it was Oscar nominated. And so it was, uh, that's Gina Rowlands and she was also Oscar nominated. So I started to think you know, what kind of story would I tell if I was gonna make a capstone film? And I'm a parent and I started thinking about sort of my life as a parent and what kind of stories I could weave together um, in, a, in a script that was like doable for a short narrative film. Um, so I took on some challenges. Uh, one thing was I, I knew I was gonna have a low budget not like I was going to really have a ton of money to make a film. I wanted to shoot 4K raw and learn that workflow. I wanted to use child actors because I feel like every year somebody does. And I thought, okay, well, why not? Um, I wanted to shoot in the winter because so many of my students do. I wanted to just know what it was like. And then I wanted to use some of those things that make continuity tricky, like fire or snow. Um, and snow is a big one because a lot of the capstone films are shot uh, in late January, February time period. Um, so here's sort of a timeline. Um, I went to the faculty writing retreat and I, I banged out a script um, in a couple days there. And it was lovely because lots of people were there working on research papers and I was sort of in this just imaginative space of writing a script. And we would all kind of bring snacks and share and talk about our work. Um, and once I had that script, I applied for a faculty development grant here and I got it. And so the next step for me was to start thinking about a crew. And the way that I approached this was um, I recruited some fantastic alumni mentors and I paired them with current students. And so every lead crew member had a mentee or, and some of them had a couple. Um, and then I had to think about casting and rather than search for professional actors, um, what I actually did was I had my friends act in the film and uh, so that was that made it a little bit easier. Um, and so the story is about a grandmother, uh, her daughter and granddaughter. And the people you see in the film are my neighbors and they are actually a grandmother, daughter and granddaughter in real life. Um, location scouting, I had to work on that. And 
uh, make a shot list. I had to take my script and figure out what kind of shots I wanted to get. All the scheduling um, and figuring out. Uh, I also used here at Keene State, we get some professional enhancement funds. So um, for two years, I used those funds to help make this happen. And then we had a four day shoot in January of 2020. And we shot in Brattleboro, Vermont and Unity, New Hampshire. So now I'm gonna show you the film. It's about 16 minutes. And I wonder if we could, is it okay to turn the lights out or is, would that be? Yeah, I think the film's gonna look the way it is for the Zoom people and it'll look better in here. Yes, we hope it looks good for the Zoom people and sounds good. Oh, hey, hon. When did you get that? Just last week. Welcome home. I'm going to do it on your way. 
Is there one? Oh, one? All right, here's it. You don't have a card, so okay, maybe you mm -hmm. Okay, here's the one. Okay, here's the one. What's the address? 42 from the hell of heaven. And the mom. See that in the woods again this year? Oh, yeah. I know it. Okay. I'll see you again soon. Okay, I'm fine. Have a nice day. You do. Tell George I said hello. I will. Um, oh, fun idea. And I use corn stuff. Well, and the horse came out of the store. Oh, hold on the horse. And he's kept saying, oh, forever and ever. Whatever it is, it's there. I don't know. Today? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know yet. Look, I got these my legs. Who is the world in that field? And why? And I like the first step. Uh, okay. Hmm. Hi, I'm Stevie. Remember you're a walker today. Okay. Okay, I'll see you at 245. Uh, and here, welcome back to the North.
Yeah, for now. Really? When did you get back? This last week. How long have you been out here? About five weeks. Listen, I don't buy the house and I got your mail, but I can't get inside. You have a key hidden somewhere? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, it's out and back under one of those big rock things. Okay. Do you even want me to check on the house? Yeah, sure. Uh, where are you and all of Spain? In Jean's garage apartment. They happen to be in here right now. Oh, good. Good. That's good. And work? Not yet. But Olive started Green Street School. She wants to know when she can come see it. Anytime. But Make sure she brings something with her to do. Are you serious? I am. This is ridiculous, Ma. She's your grandkid. She's going to want to talk to you. Well, she can't. Those are the rules. I know you don't get this now, but you will someday. I earned this time, and this is how I choose to use it. Bye. Can I bring all of my later? Yes, anytime. Just make sure that she uh, has a flashlight if she's going to stay after dark. <laughs>
Have you ever with Graham? What, you two now? I want to make the Lord's again someday. Hey. Can you clap? Yeah, you can clap. It's the, it's the movies. Yeah, so I apologize that um, it was so quiet. We tried to, we tried to boost the volume and um, couldn't figure it out. So I, I hope the folks on Zoom could hear it. Um, if anybody wants a, a link, you can email me and I'll send you the link and you can watch it at home with headphones. Um, so it sounds really nice. Um, so I just wanted to share uh, some behind the scenes photos. Um, we shot this film at a working land trust in Unity um, called Quaker City. And it's a, it's a land trust that's been in operation since the 1970s. And there's a, a, a lot of people who live um, in these little cabins sprinkled across the land and they're living very intentionally, intentionally um, with a focus on uh, cooperation and sustainability. Um, so we, we pulled all of our equipment through the snow in 10 degree weather um, on sleds. And that's how we got out to where this cabin was. Um, and we didn't have electricity out there. So we had a generator which was pulled even further out into the woods because it made a lot of noise. Um, so these were just some of the behind the scenes um, of, uh, of us at that location. And then we also used a library in Putney, Vermont. So my uh, friend happens to be the director of this library. And so I, I had access to it on a Sunday morning from like 8.30 to 12 had just Sunday morning to shoot there. Um, and this is my son's elementary school, which also gave us permission to shoot there. Um, so we shot uh, January 16th through 20th, um, 2020. And then the semester started back up and I was sort of, I was taking these uh, really large 4K raw files and I was using the computers here at school to turn them into files that I could then edit. And I had just finished that process when we were all sent home. Um, and I didn't really have access to the kind of computer that I needed to work on the film because of the kind of files um, and also I'm a parent and a solo parent. And so it was just me and my son and we just had to hang on. I'm sure everybody can relate to this, right? Um, so when he returns to school in September of 2020, um, I was actually on my first ever sabbatical. Um, and I 
began editing in earnest, I also reached out to the composer who I had wanted to work with. And I said, will you work on this film with me? Um, because she's Vermont based, I was able to pay her through a grant uh, from the Vermont Council on the Arts. Um, and then by the time February 2021 rolled around, um, I decided I really needed some professional help to finish this off. So I wrote another faculty development grant and this was to pay a colorist and a sound mixer. And what I asked these professionals to do, I explained the project to them and I said, I wanna to learn too. Um, haven't been able to, cause I'm helping with fifth grade remote learning half of the week, but I really wanna learn these things. So as we work on the film, can I just be there? So the colorist was actually in Los Angeles, but for a number of days, I joined her on Zoom while she worked. And I also had a current student join us on Zoom. Um, her name was Hunter. <laughs> and then this is Ben Rogers, whose um, studio is in Jaffrey. And uh, I hired him to do the sound mix. And a student who's a senior right now, Justin Wood, accompanied me to Jaffrey and we sat in and learned from Ben about sound mixing. Um, so at every stage of the process, I was kind of trying to create these mentor-mentee relationships with professionals and current students. And so now the film is being entered into festivals because I would love people to see this. Um, because I think when you make something with a lot of people, you really want to celebrate it. So um, I'm, I'm at a 50% success rate right now. I've heard back from four fests and I've gotten into two of them. Um, so that's pretty good. And for you current students who are just curious, like how the heck do you enter a film festival? There's a website called filmfreeway.com. You basically make a profile page for your project and it's really easy from there. Um, a lot of festivals use this website and it just gets really streamlined. Um, you just kind of find the festival and click submit, you know, and, and then you're good. Um, I also had <clears throat> a screening here on campus. Um, we did it outdoors so it could be COVID safe, but um, it got a little chilly. So it was kind of a quick event. Um, and then today at the very last minute, I had the idea to try to include some testimonials from folks who worked on the film. So I'm gonna show you uh, the pair that did sound. So Zach was the current student um, and then you'll, you'll hear from Aaron next and he was the alumni um, who's a professional sound mixer. Hi, my name is Zach McCallum and former student of Kings Bay College uh, where I got the awesome opportunity to work on Joe's film, Joy Design. Uh, where I was a beam operator, uh, under the tutelage of one Aaron Bouchard, uh, who is a, uh, just an awesome all around guy, uh, and uh, sound recordist, um, who I shadowed uh, during the production um, and met through Joe uh, specifically for that project. But uh, since then, we've kept up with uh, uh, all just having that hands-on experience uh, is critical, I think, for students. Like, getting to actually make something is just what's fun. And, you know, it's a lot of work, and it's a lot of fun, too. And it's very rewarding. Uh, and the fact that we were afforded the chance to work on something and make something, uh, we established professionals in the, in the New England film scene uh, was it's invaluable. It's it's something that I if everyone got the chance to do it, I would say take it as soon as it's on. It's just it's, 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 it's yeah, I learned so much just about, you know, setup or uh, what it means uh, what it means to be a professional in the film world. Uh, and uh, you know set up in your flow or uh, the IOT as well, or anything like that. Just anything that you could possibly learn from actually making a film, you know, professional. It was just a lot of uh, beneficial things. Uh, uh, 
Kali ini saya lihat. Okay. And so next, this is Aaron, who uh, was Zach's mentor. And I hope this will play. Is this not play? Codec unavailable. Okay. That's too bad because he's actually talking from a film set. Um, let me see if I can just play it. Uh, through something else. Let's see. This is painful. Can you hear any of it? No. Okay. It's too bad. Um, this was these were sent today, just sort of through the phone. Um, so yes, I will not torture you um, by playing a video that you can't hear. Um, but you can see uh, Aaron's on set, and uh, he sort of just echoed Zach's sentiments that it was a great learning experience. Um, and so, just to sort of wrap things up. Um, I wanted to just kind of go through what I learned. Um, well, I learned a lot of skills. I learned this 4K raw workflow. Um, I worked with some rental houses. There were some pieces of equipment that we rented. Um, directing actors was big. Collaborating with lots of crew members. And I learned a lot about color correction and color grading and a lot about sound mixing. There were some lessons that were just sort of reinforced for me as a teacher. Um, one of the big ones was that acknowledging a student's gift provides enormous affirmation. So for example, Zach is somebody that I had as a sophomore um, in sound class. And immediately I could just see this student had sort of a grasp of um, a sense of, you know, he had like a sense of rhythm and precision when it came to sound editing. And he just had a knack for it. And he loved experimentation. So he could make lots of strange sounds. Um, so he, he really had a knack for it. And when I was sort of thinking about what students to invite to do this project, he was just somebody that right away, I was like, that would be great to pair him with a sound recordist and he can learn about onset uh, sound recording. Um, and I sort of did that for everybody, the, the woman who was the art director, the student that I paired her with um, was somebody in my class who was making kind of a horror film. And she was always bringing like props and costumes to class. And I was just like, well, she's a natural for the art department because she seems like so into, you know, the stuff of filmmaking, like building a world. Um, so another lesson, uh, practicing skills at a professional level is, is going to impart confidence for students um, and collaboration <laughs> creates a lot of camaraderie. So um, by the time we finished this film, um, I think I like, you know, I had, had run out and or I had ordered from the grocery store like a cake, like we actually had a cake to celebrate, like it felt like a real accomplishment. And, um, and then as bonus, uh, I generated a lot of teaching material. So I've given students some of my footage to color correct and work with in class. Um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that I can use and just like give to them. Um, and then we had a lot of fun. So that's also a bonus. So these are projects that I really feel passionately can be designed by any program in any discipline by faculty or students. Um, these could take the shape of an independent study. I'm always kind of encouraging my students to, you know, use their agency to, to ask for what they want. Like you're here to make what you can of your time at Keene State. Um, so they connect learning in the classroom to real world experience, which is amazing um, to kind of get out of the bubble of the classroom. And especially with filmmaking, peer-to-peer -peer learning is a big thing. Collaboration is a big thing. Um, a lot of that's happening on projects like this. I think they motivate, they can motivate students to begin their own 
creative inquiry. Um, we had, uh, there were a couple of students who were, they were all juniors and seniors, but um, some of the feedback that I heard is that by working on this, that, you know, taking on that capstone project as a senior became much easier because they just had the experience under their belt. Um, establishing alumni and student networks, so those connections can help with uh, building these pathways for professional opportunities after people graduate. So um, I'm just going to finish up. And my last slide just thanks a few people who I really couldn't have done this without. Uh, Dean Sandy, uh, Dean Rabinowitz, Renee Harlow, Linda, and Kate. Um, those are folks who helped me a lot, uh, just sort of with the logistical, you know, support from the college kind of stuff. So I just wanted to publicly say thank you um, because they were invaluable. So thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Again, if you want a link so you can just hear it better, I'm happy to email one to you. Thanks. That's a question. Um, and I, I want to make sure the audience has an opportunity. I've got one too. Does anybody in the audience have a question for Professor Darren? Yeah. So how did you decide to start this film project? What, what gave you the idea? Um, I, like I said, I really felt like I, I, you know, I come from this animation background and an experimental film background, and I just felt like I wasn't really going to know how to make, how to teach my students to make a narrative film until I made a narrative film. Um, and then with regards to just like the story, is, are you curious about that? Yeah, that? I've never seen like any film like that where until I read the description you had on the screen before, I was a little confused why they were like sworn to silence, but reading the description that was on the screen, I understood that a lot better. Yeah. Where's the description? <laughs> you had it on the website. Oh, did I? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so as a storyteller. I don't know, I think, uh, so I am Georgia, but I am also Robin and I'm also the child. And it's sort of, I just took parts of me and kind of split them in to these different characters. And, you know, as, a, as an artist and a parent, I'm constantly at war over just like, I wanna be alone to make my work. Oh no, I have to be with my son and I want to be with him. And, but I also wanna be alone. <laughs> Um, especially going through COVID and such intense, you know, long stretch of time, like without school, without summer camps, without babysitters. So, you know, um, so they're just pieces of me. And then, you know, I think a lot about, uh, and the way that I sort of teach is to kind of like try to think about characters and then the conflict starts to triangulate around those characters. Um, and then the world can can start to fill in. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that struck, I got a lot of questions, but you know, the thing that really jumped out at me was how visually appealing this, this movie was. And, you know, different scenes, like the inside, the cabin was warm and colorful and the sun came in just right. And yeah. Really fun to look at. The slushy urban scene was kind of gross in Hampshire winter, but you know, captured that really nicely in different colored coat and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and I'm kind of intrigued about how much you knew that you had it as you were filming it with this 4K raw system or whether you were just hoping that you had this stuff. And, and you know, editing. And I'm also kind of curious about how much um, the, the work of the colorist yeah. uh, came in and made a difference that allowed these things that I'm, I'm seeing to come jumping out. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, we didn't, there wasn't, um, the, the color process was really fascinating because, um, you know, one thing you can do with color is, and, and just also, it's not just color, it's like the sharpness of the image and the, the just the contrast. Of, and one thing that um, 
you really can do is sort of direct the eye of the viewer to a certain part of the frame. Um, and, you know, if someone's face was a little bit more in shadow, we could actually brighten that up in post-production. And so what you get when you shoot 4K raw is you have, you have so much information that it, it becomes a really malleable in post-production. Whereas if you were to just shoot with a, say a, a digital SLR camera and shoot some video, it's sort of, it's locked in to that, the, the exposure is, and color is sort of locked in um, through a codec. And it, you can't, you can only get so much manipulation of it in post-production. So it was there, um, but, you know, we also were able to like really bring stuff out through the color process. Are you pretty happy with it digitally? I mean, I know you work in animation a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely, I am happy with it. We had uh, an interesting thing happen where the, the alumni cinematographer broke her ankle a few <clears throat> days before. So um, us, actually her mentee, Riley, just stepped up and, and shot a good amount of this. Um, I shot all the pickup images. So like all the sort of, you know, the image of the town or of the river or the, the chimney. Um, smokestack, all those sort of in-between shots I did myself. Um, so, you know, but these are the things, <laughs> these things really happen. Uh, you know, I've had students, you know, I think last year there were capstone projects where, um, you know, an actor had COVID and a student stepped up and had to act in their own film. So filmmaking is nothing if, unless, if it's not like very nimble problem solving, you know? Yeah. So we're super enjoyable. So thank you so much for being here and sharing your work Yeah, with thank us. you. Um, you clearly have talent wherever you choose to apply it. I'm just wondering um, you know, what's, what's calling you right now? Oh gosh. Um, well, I literally think my son is calling me. I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> it's just won't stop vibrating. <laughs> Um, uh, but I have, uh, so during the summer of the pan, I don't know, we're still in the pandemic, but the summer of 2020, um, I got a grant and, uh, did a series of interviews, um, with foster adoptive families in Southern Vermont. So my son is adopted through the foster care system. Um, and so we did us, I have about six or seven interviews that I have to edit. And they're all going to go on a website, and um, a lot of so most of them are with families, and then a few of them are with um, one is with like a post permanency support worker, another one is with a somatic movement therapist, who's an also an adoptive parent, and so they just give some other perspectives on adoption. So that's what I have to, that's what I have to do so next. What's that? So, so your interest in narrative filmmaking is continuing. Well, they're just, it's just audio. It's just sound. So it's just, I'll just it's sort of going to be like a podcast. Yeah. I jump around a lot, <laughs> like a, maybe too much, but yeah. So it's unfortunate we couldn't hear what the alumni mentor was, was saying, but it seems that obviously it's a enriching experience. This is a really interesting element. Our yeah. Pair of alums who are out working in the field with students who are learning. And obviously that's enriching the students. Um, did you notice from the alumni saying that they were learning new things from working with students who were coming through the program? I, I don't know if they were learning things from students. Um, but I think, you know, that that sort of collaboration that happens when, you know, it's sort of, I, I, you know, I like to think of collaboration, like the best idea wins. And so if it's the student's idea, it doesn't matter. Like the professional can take it and make it happen. So I think that we were all just offering so many ideas um, to make, make it happen that, um, you could call that learning, but I think it was 
uh, just sharing, sharing ideas. Um, and one of the sweetest memories I have was what we took like a dinner break um, in the apartment. The, the apartment setting is an Airbnb that I rented for one night. Um, and the owners were like, sure, you can shoot a film there. <laughs> I don't think they realized what was going to happen. But um, so, you know, we had, uh, I had a friend I cook for us. Um, so we took, we had lunches and dinners together. And I got a local coffee, coffee company to donate coffee. Um, and my mom was actually woke up and brewed coffee every morning for everybody. We would bring it to set in a big thing. So, but and one of the dinner breaks, um, just like this lovely, you know, informal conversation between the alumni and the students where the, they were just asking lots of questions and kind of getting advice. And, you know, it was, it was very intimate and, um, you know, alumni sharing stories. And it was, it was just one of the nicest things that happened to just in that moment of downtime for them to just kind of learn a little bit more from these people who were working professionals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how would you like us to compare the process of making a recommendation to your career? Yeah. Well, my work in animation is a lot more lonely than this because <laughs> it's it's just me unless I'm doing something for somebody like a client. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I, it requires, there was a lot of, I was getting a lot of motivation from feeling like this had a purpose behind it, like greater than just me. Um, and I think uh, that was something maybe I personally really needed, like I, it, you know, to just keep chipping away at it despite the pandemic, despite whatever was happening, um, because I wanted to get it done for everybody. So, um, yeah. And then they're similar in that, uh, you know, I think in filmmaking is a process and you can get really bogged down in the process and the way that I try to make it through that and survive is to like really put discovery at the forefront so that like you're really always trying to find things and it, it's like sifting for gems in the sand you know um but if you keep that in the forefront it's possible to work on something for two years and you don't get bored um because you're just really trying to keep making discovery like the goal um, does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a good question. Um, actually, one of the things I really liked doing this was I actually shared when I had a rough cut, I shared it with someone that I went to college with. Um, who is like an incredible storyboard artist. Um, and, you know, I, I just was like, Pete, can you, can we talk? Can you give me some feedback? And he had just delivered me like the most, um, you know, <laughs> detailed feedback about just like, could you take, you know, could you take this and put it over here? And this is on screen for two seconds too long. And, um, and it was, it was such a gift to have somebody pay that close attention. And it was somebody that I've known for 20 years and they know me. And, you know, so it was, it was great to have somebody be sort of that critical, but also helpful, like really, really helpful. So I, I don't know, that just popped into my mind. Um, I liked, uh, you know, despite how cold it was, I really liked being outside with everybody and just like the hustle and bustle of it in the sleds and the generator and stuff. That was pretty fun. Yeah. So I'm most interested in casting in movies. So I was just wondering, how did you know that it was the perfect for you to Yes, yes. I, um, so as I mentioned, those are my neighbors. 
And if you've ever taken a class with Professor John Gittleson, you might also be interested to know that that's his wife, his daughter, and his mother-in-law. <laughs> so I just borrowed them was sort of how I, um, how I approached it. I feel like uh, another thing I feel about filmmaking is like, whether it's live action or documentary or animation, it's like, you're always, you're sort of scheming to get people to do what you want, you know? So at some point I approached them and I was just like, I have this, have this idea, would you guys be open to this? And Olive, the child, she does local theater. So she was excited. Um, and Georgia had actually done some theater. So, and I knew Robin could sing. Um, and I, and they were part of the process. You know, I asked Olive, like, what do you want to do in the movie? And she said, oh, I want to wear my princess dress. So we put that in the movie. Um, so it was collaborative. Um, but for me, it was sort of, um, you know, they were available resources and they were kind of my muses. So that's how I found them. And the librarian I found through Peggy Ray or through Peggy Ray's friend um, pointed me toward Jenny who played the librarian. And then all the women at the commune are people from Unity, New Hampshire for the most part, just neighbors. The, a call went around like, hey, they need somebody to chop wood tomorrow. And then they all showed up, which was pretty great. Yeah. Um, so you kind of started and ended the presentation with the idea of a practical project. Um, yeah. Like the senior practical for the film department. Do you have any ways that you would encourage other professors at Team State to incorporate that into other majors? Yeah, I think it could be applied to any any major, really. Um, and I think and, and I think it's not just faculty. It's not just that faculty could design. It doesn't have to go from faculty designing it and incorporating students. I think students could design it and pitch it as an independent study and approach a faculty and say, can you facilitate this? This is what I want to do. And you guys have access. I'm on the, I help read and evaluate the Center for Creative Inquiry grants. So three times a semester, there's a deadline where you can get some funding for a project. Um, Creative inquiry is one of the college-wide learning outcomes. So we, we've got to like walk the walk and encourage people to, to do some creative inquiry. Um, so I think it could go both ways, you know? Yeah, like the one I did in graduate school, I designed that myself. I sort of came up with it. Um, so I think it's, it could go both ways. I think students could approach a faculty member and say, I have this idea or faculty can get students to get on board. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Are we gonna be around for a few minutes? Yeah, after? I'll be around. Yeah, thank okay. you so much, everybody. Any questions? Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you.